Well, good morning, everybody. How are y'all doing today on this Tuesday? That the weather's good, that the air's drying out a little bit out there, right? So it's feeling better. And we are here to resume our journey through 1 Samuel. Today, we get the thrill of proving me wrong. That'll be fun. You know, um, we get to some more of the great stories that the uh, that have been brought, handed down to us um, about David and Saul. So um, I'm just thrilled to be here with everybody. So I don't really have much in the way of business or anything. Um, Ralph is real good about taking attendance and getting the red box moving and generating a headcount for us. <coughs> a reliable guy. Thank you, Ralph. And I, I know he hates that when I do that, but you know, really, he's done it for many years now, and I thank him for it. So, um, uh, like I said last week, we're going to be here on Tuesdays for a while until Patty and I make some actual plans and maybe go somewhere for a little bit this summer. We'll be here on, on Tuesdays. So, let's see. Before I get started, is there anything y'all would like to talk about before I pray and get get going here anything at all stars game seven yes they defeat the kraken the kraken the kraken and now they play now they play las vegas <laughs> yes the golden knights of like golden something coming from vegas right so um Anything at all? <coughs> all right, well, let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are grateful to be here today, and we are grateful to be, to be gathered in this way. Um, you're, we know it is your Spirit who has called us here and formed us into this fellowship that we enjoy, that I enjoy so much. Um, and we pray today as we return to the stories of David and Saul that you will help us to enjoy them. Um, to, to see in them uh, a, a word for us and for our own lives about who you are and who we are. Um, and I uh, want to lift up today uh, Greg Wood, a member of our Sunday morning class who had um, emergency heart surgery yesterday. That went a very long time, but he is doing well. He's resting well, and um, it's just uh, we're grateful for the miracle of modern medicine, what, what the doctors and the techs and you know, all the hospitals. Um, so, in any event, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I know it is going in and out. I know that, and there's nothing I can do about that. That, that seems to be some feedback mechanism between the microphone and this. At least that's what Lauren said, you remember I tried it over there, but everywhere I go, there are these little um, speakers. So I'm going to stand right here, and if it goes out, it goes out, but it, it'll be right back. So the, the streaming people are the ones who get a moment of utter silence, right? So there we go. But we will make do with all of that. So let's see, my friends, we are in the 23rd chapter of 1 Samuel in the 15th verse. And David is on the run. S Saul is pursuing him. David has an assembly, a fighting band of about 600 warriors and assorted other folks who might be, be with them. Um, <laughs> you remember <coughs> last week that David uh, played the madman in, in a Philistine city and so forth. But, but if you think back to the last time we saw David and Jonathan, I said that that was the last time they met, and I was simply wrong. There we go. See, that's the thing about doing what I do here. You know, like at least 25% at least of what I say is wrong. Maybe 50%. I just don't know which 25 or 50% it is, right? So, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, you're dealing with ancient writings from long ago and an ancient man teaching. <laughs> so, 
yeah. So I'm going to put up this little map we've been using, just as nice and clear and plain, and we're going to come to this encounter between David and Jonathan. Yes, sir? It says, you know, those numbers are often a stretch. 600 is a lot to support in the wilderness. But it went from 400, when we first encountered his band of warriors, to 600. They are desperados, right? So I don't find that number to be unbelievable, really, at all. I think it reflects um, the attraction of David. Remember, David is the one who kills, has killed tens of thousands. And regardless, I think it's supposed to convey to us that David himself has a very large band of fighters. He's not, he, he, yes, Saul is chasing David, but David isn't really alone in this. And, and that band of fighters will be with David for a very, very long time, even, if, even after he ascends to the throne. He will still have an inner circle of, of men who are his closest um, warriors. This, these are warrior cultures. Um, the, the, the tribal chieftain is the chief warrior of the tribe. So it's, um, it's really an essential part of seeing David as king, is him having this band of warriors. Because that's, that's the world they lived in. Okay, good question. All your questions are good. Okay. So look at verse 15. While David was at Horish in the desert of Ziph, okay, that's there in this Judean wilderness there, you see the little Ziph there, that Saul had come out. Um, verse 15, chapter 23, well, verse 15, 23, 15, okay, we cool? Am I cool? Am I know where I am? While David was at Horish in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. Right? And Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horish and helped him find strength in God. So the bond that they shared, the bond which is really more Jonathan than David, is still there, and Jonathan goes to find David at Horesh to help him find strength. And he says to David, don't be afraid. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. Okay, so think back to when David and Jonathan first met, and Jonathan took off all the accoutrements uh, of royalty, right? the belt, the tunic, the sword, and he gave them all to David, right? And um, certainly Jonathan is not alone in his sense, his knowledge that his father is descending further and further into darkness and that David will be the next king. And he says that I'll be your second, right? Verse 18, the two of them made a covenant before Yahweh, then David went home, but Dave, Jonathan went home, but David remained at Horesh. Now the Ziphites went up to Saul at Gibeah and said, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds of Horesh, on the hill of Hekelah, south, south of Jeshimon? Now, your majesty, come down whenever it pleases you to do so, and we will be responsible for giving him into your hands. So these are people who want to, you know, offer tribute to Saul in modern contemporary urban language. They're trying to suck up to Saul, right? And they say, come on down. We will get David for you. We will turn him into your hands, and thus we will be your, you know, your, your, your favored folks. And Saul said, the Lord bless you for your concern for me. Go and get more information. Find out where David usually goes and who has seen him there. They tell me he is very crafty. <laughs> that little David, he's very crafty, you know. That's not a compliment. 
find out about all the hiding places he uses and come back to me with definite information, sure information. By now, even by now, Saul's a little tired of chasing his tail, trying to find David. But you, you, you have to understand the nature of the lands that David is in. These are lands that are desolate. They are filled with caves. They are, it would just be very easy to hide. So if you know the, the geography, the topography of the place, it's not hard to understand why David is able to hide from him. Okay, but find out all the hiding places you use and come back to me with certain, definite, sure information. Then I'll go with you. If he's in the area, I'll track him down among all the clans of Judah. We will flush him out. Right? Verse 24, so they went out and they went to Ziph ahead of Saul. Now David and his men were in the desert of Maon. So here's, it. again, the geography is very small. He's, so now he's down in, in this area, northwest of Masada, west of En Gedi, um, a, good, a decent distance south of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is not yet Israelite. It's, an, it's a Jebusite city. That's why the name is Jebus. So... David and his men were in the desert of Maon in the Arabah south of Jershimon. Saul and his men began the search, and when David was told about it, he went down to the rock and stayed in the desert of Maon. When Saul heard this, he went into the desert of Maon in pursuit of David. He thinks he's got him cornered now. By golly, I know where he is. I'm going to go right to that same place. And so Saul was going along one side of the mountain, and David and his men were on the other side, hurrying to get away from Saul. As Saul and his forces were closing in on David and his men to capture them, a messenger came to Saul saying, Come quickly. The Philistines are raiding the land. Then Saul broke off his pursuit of David and went to meet the Philistines. That is why they call this place Selah Hamalakath. <laughs> I should have looked that one up. I'm getting pretty good with names, but that one's a doozy. That looks like an Hawaiian name to me. <laughs> yeah. And so David went up from there. He went up from here. Saul is pulled away. And David went to En, went to en Gedi. Okay? So um, Jonathan has met David. Jonathan has encouraged David. Jonathan, they've made, they've renewed their covenant. Jonathan recognizes that David um, will be the accepted king of Israel um, and, and Saul is having a heck of a time tracking David down, even with the help of local people because of the nature of the lands. Okay? All right. So any thoughts or questions? Now, what is En Gedi? En Gedi is an oasis. You know what an oasis is. Out in the misery of desolate desert, you find a place where there is water and trees and animals, and that's En Gedi. Um, I have a few photos. A couple of them came from Jim Hess when he went to Israel. This is one of the waterfalls in En Gedi. Right? You could, we saw a bride there one time. She was getting married there. She was down in the water in her gown and they were all gathered. It's really, it's really what makes En Gedi such a lovely place. It is in the middle of the moonscape. Down by the Dead Sea, there's really nothing down there. Like out at Qumran, um, which is fur further north of here, it's just, it's just brown, dead. Mars, Mars, that, whatever desolate place you can imagine. But a lot of caves because there's a lot of limestone, and limestone is very porous. And even though there's not much rain, it doesn't take much rain to create openings in the porous limestone. And so this is a waterfall where, um, and it's just beautiful, and it's a natural place for David to go. Um, there are several waterfalls like this at En Gedi. This is one. Here's another one. Okay, there's, li there's animals in there. 
there's a little whatever that is. <laughs> Got to be related to a rat, I'm guessing. Um, big one. Yeah, big one. Little, little, anima, little animals like these. What do we call these? Hyrax, I think that is what they are. And there are also, I couldn't find the picture. Maybe Patty's got it on her phone, but anyway. Uh, there are, you'll see a little four-legged creature that is like a little tiny Hyrax or antelope or something actually standing on the branch, very thin branch of very thin trees. I guess they are just so light. But there's this, there's this, it's a lot of wildlife in Engedi. Wilds are wildlife in Engedi because there's water there. Yeah. There's water there. And there's water not in any place around it. So it's a natural place that David would go to hide out. He would have water. There are a lot of caves that he can hide in. Um, and so that's Engedi. All right? So I'll put this map back up, and you can see En Gedi. It's right if you're driving. Usually, when we go to Israel, we're dry, we stop at En Gedi. We have spent much of the day at Masada, and then we make our way back up the roadway that runs along the western side of the Dead Sea, and we pull in and we stop at En Gedi. And I really like it because <coughs> when Christians go to the Holy Land, the places we tend to go to are all New Testament places. And so I, I've, I tried to design the past trips in such a way that we also get a little bit of Old Testament sense. So we go to En Gedi. Now we're, um, is one of them. And it really is, it's just kind of cool. Right, Patty? You agree with me, dear? For, thank you. Okay. <laughs> What's that? Hebron is... Ziph, Mayon, I don't know. You know, it's one of those places where you're driving around on roads and you see sometimes road signs pointing to like Ramah and some of these, but I, I don't know. There, there's still something there, right? There's still something there. And they may even go by names similar to the names this far back. Names of places don't stay static. Names of places change over time. That's why in... The Sea of Galilee is the Sea of Galilee, the Lake of Galilee, the Chenereth Sea. It has just gone by different names over time. Um, Jerusalem, not yet known as Jerusalem, will be, but right now is Jebu simply because it's the city of the Jebusites. So, anyway, that's the best I can do. All right, so David is... <clears throat> living in the strongholds of En Gedi. Good, good place to hide out. Well, for chapter 24, anything else before we start a new story? Yes? This whole area is not very large at all, is it? Not very large at all. Okay. Not, you know, all of, all of modern Israel, mm -hmm. from up in the north down to, well, down close to Gaza, not including, you know, the Sinai. All of that can fit in a space from Denton to Waxahachie and Fort Worth to Grand Prairie. Yep. It's not very far. You can drive from the western to the eastern border of Israel in less than an hour. Yep. It's just not, it's just not very, it's just not very big. But it's important. An important thing to grasp is that it was like a superhighway for the great empires of the day. Because once you, once you get to the eastern side of the, this mountain range, it's not that they aren't, you know, people who live in the Rockies would laugh that I called it a mountain. But this, this ridge line here, which, which so, so, the, so the, 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 wind, the rains come in over the Mediterranean, they go up, are dumped by the mountaintop, and then there's no rain left. And so this is all this desert region and the Dead Sea. And from then on, it's just desert, 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 desert for hundreds of miles. So the great empires of the day, Egypt to the south, Assyria, to the north, um, Babylon and Persia to the east, they, when they want to get e at each other, which they did, the way they had to get at each other was through Israel, this narrow strip 
between the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean. And that's why when you come to the Old Testament stories, these empires are pushing on Israel all the time. Israel is so, so beset by these, these empires because Israel sits there like, a, like, a, like the high five over on Central or something. It's just the place, the, it's just like the squeeze point that these empires have to get through to, to get at each other. And they did like to get at each other. Okay, so 24-1, okay, any questions? All right, so after Saul had returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David is in the desert of En Gedi. He's in En Gedi. So now Saul's going to go get him. So Saul took 3,000 able young men, and yes, Doc, I think it might be 3,000 men. That's, that's a manageable number. 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. Oh, I guess I should put this back up. They might qualify as wild goats. I don't know. Right? So he's going to go down to En Gedi and get David. He's got 3,000 men with him to accomplish this. How many men does David have with him? 600. So Saul is a fighting force outnumbering David... Five to one, which is, in my military experience, is the appropriate number to have if you're the attacking force. You'd like to have a five to one advantage. So, verse three. Saul came to the sheep pens along the way. Why are there sheep pens there? Water. A cave was there, lots of caves. And Saul went in to relieve himself. <laughs> right? He needs a restroom. <laughs> okay? We're going we're gonna to understand what we're reading here today. Just, I'm, just, just, I'm just preparing you. Now, David and his men were far back in that very cave. So how is it that with all the caves there are in En Gedi, and there are, you could go there yourself and you just walk through the walk, walk the length of En Gedi, and you'll see cave, 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 cave. How is it that Saul goes into the one cave in which David and his men are way at the back? And Saul is ignorant of that. He doesn't know that, right? You know, it's like we make a mistake if we only see God at work when we're explicitly told God is at work. The book of Esther has not a single mention of God. The word God is missing utterly from the book of Esther. But is God absent? Of course not. Is God absent here? Of course not. Am I, do I think this is a coincidence? No, I don't. I don't think this is a coincidence. And in our world today, people, Christians, are inclined to see God at work only in what they are inclined to call miracles. And that's not the way to understand God's work in this world. Many things that people would have seen as miraculous a hundred years ago, we see as commonplace today. So... What happens as technology advances and medicine advances, the, the territory for miracles, as it were, shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. And if we only see what's called the God of the gaps, right? There, we only see God in the stuff that we can't explain, we're missing most of what God does. Most of what God does in this world, read the Bible, most of what God does in this world are not giant, spectacular, fiery things. Most of what God does in this world is small and personal. There are only three periods in the Bible in which you find miracles, basically. With Moses, you find them with Elijah and Elisha, and you find them with Jesus and then the apostles for a period of how long 
40 years, 50 years before the apostles are, are dead, um, after Jesus' death and resurrection. So the, the Bible isn't replete with miracles from beginning to end. And if that's the only place you can, you can see God at work, you're, 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 being, you're, you're blinding yourself to the glories of how God works in our life in small ways. Now, if you said to me, well, okay, Scott, well, how do you know specifically how God is working in your, in your life? And I would say to you, well, I'm not sure. Okay, <laughs> right? <coughs> so, you know, a long time ago, I came up with this way of thinking about this, that when, <laughs> when, when really good things happen in my life, I will see God at work in those things. How, were, how did a Patty and I come together through my brother Steve after the death of Patty's first husband and my wife at the time running off with her bartender? True story. So how did, how did that come to be? So I, I, I'm confident that God was at work in that, okay? I can't prove it, but I, you know, everything, you can't prove anything. What can you prove in life? You can prove Euclidean geometry in the 10th grade. Short of that, you can't really prove anything. You can't really even prove DNA, right? DNA is still stated when it's properly done as a probability, maybe one in a billion, but still, it's a probability. So when it's good, I give God the credit. When things are not working out well, I try to take the blame. Do I, am, am, I, am I always good at taking the blame for it myself? No, of course not. Most of the time I want to shift it to somebody else. But, but you know, you have to try to see God at work in this world. And I would prefer to see God at work in this world too often then not enough. That's just me. So I think that, how do they end up at the same cave? I guarantee you this, the ancient Israelites who told this story over and over and over and over and over again did not see it as any coincidence that the two of them are in this cave, Saul coming in to relieve himself and David hiding in the back of the cave. And of course Saul has to relieve himself. They're out there in the wilderness there's not even porta potties out there. So David and his men were far back in the cave. I guess I should pause. Any thoughts or questions about what I just said? Well, it, it doesn't say all the men are in the same cave. It just says David and his men, some men, could be some of the 600 are, are in that cave. It would have to be a pretty big cave. But it doesn't say all his men, just, just men. Just his men, more, okay? So again, 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 we, uh, yeah, what's the point? David is in the back of the cave and he's got some of his men with him at least. He's not alone. He's got some of his men with him. So what do the men say, his, his warriors? Well, this is the day Yahweh spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. For the men say, look, Saul's being offered up to you on a silver platter. Go do something. Exactly. What do you think? Why do you think God brought him in here? Right? Just to relieve himself? No. He's delivering you. Go take care of him. This is the way it worked. Right? What do they expect David to do? Yeah, exactly. Saul has been hunting, hunting, hunting David. Has David done anything to Saul? No. Any sign Saul is relenting? No. Dave, Saul's son Jonathan has sworn himself to whom? David, David not Saul. So sure, David's men are saying, oh, wow, look what God has done. He's brought him into this cave right here, David. Man, oh man, can you believe it? Look what God has done. So David then crept up through the cave. It's dark and it's quiet and Saul is occupied. <laughs> okay, now, if you're going to ask me how this story is actually working, it only makes sense 
if he did not just go in there for number one, but also number two. <laughs> so, hey, we don't necessarily want to admit it, but we all do that. Right? So we, David creeps up unnoticed in the dark. Ca ca the caves are dark, right? And David's being very stealthy. And he creeps up. And you know his men are so excited. There's, oh, gosh, gosh. And David has a knife with him. What do they think he's going to go do? He's going to go slit Saul's throat or something. But what does he do? He cuts a little corner off Saul's robe where Saul is laid at while he is taking care of his business. Oh, man. Afterward. So, it, so afterward. Okay. So now what has happened? Well, obviously, David has crawled back to his men with a little piece of fabric. <laughs> and his men would be thinking to themselves, what the heck? You, this is it? This grand opportunity brought to you by God himself, and you come back with this? And Saul, who hasn't realized anything has happened, right, has gotten up and cleaned himself up, however they did that, and made him, right, gone on about his, his day. So afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. That's all he did. He didn't try to, he didn't assault Saul. He didn't try to slit his throat or stab him in the back. He is conscious, stric, conscious is stricken by simply having cut off a bit of Saul's robe. And he said to his men, Yahweh forbid that I should do such a thing to my master. Yahweh's anointed. Or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of Yahweh which is a true statement. David knows that Saul was anointed by God through Samuel to be king. And David's, it reveals to you something of David's character, does it not? He has the, he, he has the opportunity to be very worldly and the rest of it, but... This is God's anointed, and David is not going to harm him. He doesn't, he's, he, he feels badly even having cut off the corner of the fabric, corner of the robe, for he is the anointed of Yahweh. And just remind yourself, there was a little, there was an article about this in the Wall Street Journal, and the, the, every week there's a, like a little, little religion column. This was about the um, anointing of Charles III in England, who, away from the cameras, was anointed in a religious sense, um, which is a ceremony going back hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of years in England. And the anointed one of Israel in Hebrew is simply Mashiach which comes to us as Messiah. Messiah simply means the anointed one and was a royal term. And Jesus as Messiah is King, De King Jesus. And here Saul is the anointed one. The, the, the piece of the story, of course, that is essential to understand is that David is the anointed one also. David is king already and not yet. But David is correct. Saul is the anointed one of God. So verse 7. So with these words, David sharply rebuked his men, right? And did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. So David in this is what? Um, is, this is a virtuous act on David's part. You know, I don't have to put it in the context of the Old Testament or something or the law of Moses. This is a virtuous act. 
And we humans who are made in the image of God, all of us, we have wrestled with what is virtuous. Aristotle had a lot to say about what is virtuous. And there were very, very good things that Aristotle had to say about what is virtual, about what is virtuous. Courage, wisdom, and the rest. And I think we live in a time when, not even in a religious sense, people are just losing, they're losing this sense that we need to be virtuous and we need to teach our children the virtues and urge them to live a virtuous life not just to give in to whatever it is they want to do that day or whatever bit of fun or pleasure they might be seeking, but that the virtues themselves are the ways that we not only order society, they are the ways that we come to live the life that in truth everybody wants, a life that is fulfilling, a life that is satisfying. And... So it's, it's here, David rebukes his men. This is, this would be wrong for you. I, I know what you want to do. You certainly pick up any textbook on geopolitics of the day. And they would tell you, yeah, yeah. You assassinate Saul, making room for David. Um, watch any story set in the medieval world or the ancient world about kings and so forth. Game of Thrones or something. It's, it was how you got rid of kings. You assassinated them, you poisoned them, whatever. The story of the house of the, of the Caesars is a story of people just having, to just, just getting rid of the Caesars when they felt that they needed to do that. So David rebukes his own men and allows Saul to leave the cave unharmed. Yeah. Peter, Peter does some terrible things. He denies Jesus. He falls asleep in the garden. Um, and yet, Jesus forgives him. Pa Peter leads the folks in, the, uh, in Jerusalem in Act 1 when the Holy Spirit comes on Peter and he has the benefit of the Holy Spirit. He rises to preach this very powerful sermon that day. We can all strive for the virtues. I just fear that we live in a world in which the idea of striving to be virtuous strive is not even an idea that comes to people's mind anymore. You know? And I'm not just talking in a religious sense. I because all the world is God's, right? Right. We shouldn't be surprised that Aristotle laid out the four cardinal virtues. That should not surprise us. Aristotle's made in the image of God. We are all human. And we can... There's some things that we can come to understand about who we are that really matter. And I just fear we're losing some of that. So anyway, David demonstrates... that he is a man of good character. Now, let me ask you, for those of you who know David's story, will he always be, does that, being a man of good character, is he a cardboard, is he a cardboard figure? Two-dimensional, he only does the right, he only does what is good? No, that would be Hollywood. That's not who David is. He is like us. He does some terrible things. There are, yes, there's things he does with Bathsheba and her husband, but there's more after that. David is, he is like us, but what sets him apart is his willingness to come to God in genuine repentance, right? That's what we saw lacking in Saul. When Saul was disobedient to God, we didn't get a sense that Saul was coming to God, you know, in deep repentance, acknowledging what he had done wrong. Okay, so now Saul has left the cave. 
Verse 8, Then David went out of the cave, and he called out to Saul, My Lord, the king. Can you imagine how surprised Saul was? <laughs> I thought I had the bathroom all to myself in there. I can't get a moment's peace. No. Of course he's shocked that he's been looking for David. <clears throat> looking, 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 all to no avail. Now he goes in to relieve himself, comes out of the cave, and who's, who's shouting to him from behind him? It's David. Would he recognize David's voice? Yeah, because yeah, David's part of the royal court. David's been playing his lyre and... Saul's the one who dressed him up in the armor, he thinks, to go fight Goliath before David takes it all off. So, my lord the king, David shouts. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. That is called obeisance. O-B-E-I-S-A-N-C-E, -E, obeisance. That is an ancient Near Eastern custom um, that still lives on in various varieties around the world where a, a subject is acknowledging that they are the subject and the king is the king. And so sure enough, he would get down on the ground and he would put his arms forward and he would put his forehead to the ground acknowledging what? That Saul is king. And then he says to Saul in verse 9, Why do you listen when men say, David is bent on harming you? This day you may have seen with your own eyes how Yahweh delivered you into my hands in the cave. You were there for the taking, Saul. You were there for the taking. You were exposed. You couldn't have defended yourself. You had taken all that stuff off to take care of your business. Right? That's why that's, that's why that stuff that is part of the central part of the story. Saul is, was utterly exposed. Right? Yes, Patty, literally, yes. No, thank you, Patty. <laughs> Verse 10, This day you have seen with your own eyes how Yahweh delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is Yahweh's anointed. See my father, by that he's not father in a you know, geneal genealogical sense, but he, his, his, this is his king. See my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hands. I cut off the corner of your robe, but I did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May Yahweh, may Yahweh judge between you and me, and may Yahweh avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. David does not want to be an evildoer. Doing evil deeds. And so he... It's a, this is a big moment in the book of Samuel, I think, when, when David forswears the opportunity to get rid of Saul and instead comes to Saul and says, look what I could have done, but I didn't. What have I done to you? Do you think, it's, you think Saul is going to be ready to make up with David and they'll all be forgiven and all that kind of thing? Nah. Saul is too deep into his spiritual darkness for that. But you can see who David is striving to be. You know, it's a good thing to be striving to be a person of good character, even if, you're, even if you fail at it sometimes. There's real value in the striving to be a, good, a person of good character. And that's, that's who David is striving to be here. Okay. Any thoughts or questions at this point? Yes.
He is showing a lot of respect to Saul. He's showing a lot of respect to Saul. Well, yeah. Well, you would think, but what's going to happen is Saul is not going to give up the chase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Don't you think when David was prostrate on the ground, Saul didn't have the idea that, oh, this is my chance, and he didn't do anything? Well, we don't know. We don't know how far, we don't know how far David was from Saul, right? So, since we're not, we don't have a hint of that in the text, I'm guessing, this is just my guess, that David was smart enough to be far enough from Saul that Saul couldn't turn around and quickly, you know, <laughs> well, <laughs> you were foolish, boom, you're dead. Yes? In the cave, yes, in the cave. He got caught, he caught all the way up there, but Saul, I don't know. Saul was occupied. <laughs> maybe, I don't know. Maybe Saul's having, maybe Saul's having troubles. I don't know, but the idea, <laughs> the idea is that David, yeah, okay, so, so all right, so let, let's think about this. All right, I didn't start this. So, 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 so Saul goes into the cave. Now, what is he wearing when he goes into the cave? King stuff. He's wearing king stuff, which is a lot, a decent amount of stuff. He's got belts. He's got swords. He's got tunics. He's got the, he's got the symbols of kingship with him. And he takes that stuff off, including his robe, and he lays it down. And then he goes and takes care of business, because you wouldn't, you would, you, that's how it would be. So David didn't necessarily have to crawl right up next to Saul in order to reach his robe, because I think Saul probably took all that off. I don't know, though. Really, I don't. I've never, <laughs> I've never, never done what Saul did. Okay, so, all right. Okay, so verse 14. This is, this is going on. David's going on. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing? A dead dog? A flea? May Yahweh be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. To be vindicated is to be proved right. Jeremiah was vindicated when he called God's judgment down on the temple about 40 years before it was destroyed by the Babylonians. He was vindicated by the Babylonian destruction because that's what he had said would happen. Jesus is vindicated by his judgment called down on the temple when he goes into the temple of the last week of his life on earth and turns the table over. In the court, in the temple courtyards, and 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 invokes the words of Jeremiah, and sure enough, about forty years later, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. That's Jesus's vindication. So David wants to be vindicated um, in this confrontation by being shown to be in the right, which will be shown by God delivering, um, protecting. David from Saul. That's what he means by delivering me from your hand. Okay? Well, when David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. Wow. See? He doesn't really, in this moment, he doesn't have revenge on his mind. He wept aloud. He says, you are more righteous than I. Righteous is simply a word that means doing what is right. And where do we, from whom do we learn what is right? Jesus, God, not ourselves. We are not good arbiters of right and wrong. 
at the end of the book of Judges, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And it's a condemnation of, the, of Israel that they were no longer striving to do what was right in God's eyes. They were doing what was right in their own eyes. So Saul is weeping, and he says, You are more righteous than I. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. It's shocking that that happened. It's shocking that Saul was right there, and David had every opportunity to do what would happen 99.9999% of the time in the ancient world, and David did not take advantage of it. He let it go. And he rebuked his men for wanting to take advantage of it. Verse 19. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? David does here. It's not, that's not the world's way. But it's God's way. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? Law of Moses. You, Exodus 25. You find your enemy's oxen tied to a tree. Do you keep it? No, you take it to him. Your enemy. Your enemy. What are we supposed to do with our enemies? We're supposed to love them, which is not a statement about sentiment, but it is a statement about behavior. It is a statement about behavior. Treatment of, classically, POWs. One's treatment of people captured in war should be an expression of how the captors would want to be treated if they were the captives. When a man, verse 19, when a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May Yahweh, Yahweh reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by Yahweh that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. So what do we have here? Who else asked this of David? Who else asked the same thing of David? Jonathan. Jonathan did. Jonathan asked the same thing of David. Jonathan said, I know, you're, I know you will be king, but when that day comes, please, please, please protect my family. And now Saul is saying, please, please, please protect my family because in this world... King's families were often murdered when the king died. If there, was a, if there was question about succession or there were rivals for the throne, the families were killed because they, the families would supply future claimants to the throne or people who might try to lead rebellion because the throne was stolen from their father. David is not the proper worldly successor to Saul, who is the proper worldly successor to, Paul, to Saul? And who is the proper worldly successor to Jonathan? His firstborn son, primogeniture, was worked, worked then, has worked, you know, it's how it was done for many, many centuries. So, um, now, this is not a recommendation. Okay, this is not a television recommendation. But Patty and I have been watching House of Dragon, which is the prequel to Game of Thrones. And it is basically set in the medieval world. Okay, not the medieval world of planet Earth, some other medieval world. Okay, but it's very it's completely medieval. And in it there is a lot of struggle for the throne. And what are people concerned about? 
having sons murdered because they would pose a threat to whoever does take the throne. It was the way the world worked. It's Herod killed his own sons. He was so scared of people wanting to take his throne away. He murdered a wife of his. He was so scared of having taken his throne away. It was a nasty, nasty, evil way to be. But it is the way that it was. And so what Saul is asking, what Jonathan asks, is asking, is completely understandable. And you need to remember it because it's actually going to be really important a ways down the road. So when these promises come up, you need to kind of file them away in your brain because they're going to be really important when we get further down the road. Okay? So, thoughts, questions? Like I said, not a television recommendation. It's pretty rough. <laughs> but I like it. So, all right. Yes? Is John Snow in this? No. no, see, it's set about 200 years before. So John Snow is just out there in the beautiful future, right, Jan? Yes. <laughs> Cute little John Snow, yes. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> You guys crack me up. So there has to be a reason we watch those shows. For women that will actually watch it, there's got to be some John Snow person in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, in like in my Sunday school class, what did I what did I bring for you Sunday? Conan the Barbarian, <laughs> right? Arnold Schwarzenegger, young and strong. Yeah, sure, I get that. <laughs> What I haven't brought lately is a is Thor, honey. Some people here are remember it. anyway. It's been a while. Or, or who? Thor. For, if you go back, this is back when my Sunday school class was meeting in Festival Hall. Cindy, um, Patty was very much taken with the guy who played Thor. What's his name, dear? Chris Hemsworth. Yes, yes. So I would look for occasions to bring Thor. And all this mighty manliness to class. My, we have fun in my Sunday class. I try to make it that way while we're learning. You know, I'm of the generation that if you're going to do it, you're going to try to have fun with it. Okay, so, verse 22. So, David gave his oath to Saul. Again. Now, what does the, for some people, the oaths mean nothing. People can, oh, it's easy to make a promise to somebody. It's easy to take an oath. Sure, it's just words. But for other people, including David, such an oath has great meaning. David is, it's a right and good thing to keep your oath sometimes. David makes an oath here, and he is going to keep that oath. I'll tell you another. Um, let me finish it up. Then Saul returned home. But David and his men went up to the stronghold. So, end of story. Now, we're not going to start the next chapter because it's a completely different story, which is wonderful. So, oath taking. What does Jesus say about oaths? Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Oaths, it's a, it's a good thing if you make a righteous, intelligent, wise, virtuous promise to keep that promise. God does. God comes to Abraham and says, I'm going to make, give you a land and descendants and, and, and all the families are going to be blessed through you. That is a promise that is right and good because God makes it and God is right and good. And so the whole rest of the story in Scripture that we're given, God's work in this world is about the keeping of that promise which culminates in Jesus. But we're not God. So we sometimes make oaths that we should never have made. And the most famous story of an oath that should not have been made is the story of Jephthah. Jephthah was a judge during the time of the judges, so it's before this time. 
and Jephthah was the judge of Israel, and he made a promise to God that, come on, give us victory here, and I will offer in sacrifice to you the first thing I see when I get home. I think he thought it would be like a goat. Instead, they win the battle. He goes home, and what is the first thing he sees? His daughter, his beloved daughter. And then she says to her father, okay, let me go away with my friends for a couple of months and we are going to, you know, live life and mourn my virginity because I will never marry and all this kind of stuff. And then she comes home and the story kind of ends. It never explicitly says that, she was, that Jephthah sacrificed her. But it certainly implies it. Now, was that a good oath to make? That was a stupid oath to make. You don't know who's, what you're going to see first when you get home, right? He could have said, you know, God, please give me, give me victory here and I will be loyal to you every day for the rest of my life. He, that's an oath he might not keep, but it's not stupid like the oath that Jephthah did make. So generally, Jesus is right on this. Ah, sure, let your yes be yes and your no be no. We shouldn't have to take oaths to keep our word. We should keep our word because that is righteous and it is virtuous. So, anyway, I am going to end it. I can take questions. I just have a meeting that started at, actually it started at noon upstairs. And I, I don't want to start chapter 25 because it's another great story. One of the great heroines of the Bible will come to next week. Yes. Okay, how old is David at this time? I will say early 20s. But I'm just guessing. You know, we don't get good time markers. We don't get to good time markers, but I would say something like that. You know, I don't know. It's hard to say. Any other questions, things you'd like to talk about before we, before we close it up today? Andy, you look like you want to say something, my friend. Someone got shot on the toilet. Have I ever seen a movie or TV program where someone got shot on the toilet? Yes, yes. I have. Yes. Oh. Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Not the best way to go. With a crossbow. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I know I was in trouble by ringing that up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Mike. Uh, just in case I won't be here next week, I just want to make a comment. Abigail is one of my favorite Old Testament characters because she was such a cagey woman. Okay, well, that's the story we're going to, yep, we're going to get to her story next week, sure enough. Only because I might not be here. So okay, thank you for that, Mike. Anything else? Anybody would like to raise, would like to ask? We have a few minutes here. Not like they're waiting for me upstairs. What? Putting what off? I know. Patty says I'm putting this off. You're right, Patty. But I really, we, if I would go on, except we finished 24. So the next chapter is up 25. New story. Okay. Well, let's pray then. Gracious Lord, we are grateful. Help us to see in this story of David in the cave. That David does a righteous thing. He does a righteous thing in, in his sparing of Saul's life. And then, re surprisingly, that righteous act on the part of David leads to Saul grasping, at least for a bit, that he has, David hasn't harmed him. And Saul weeps. So it, it's... We never know where righteousness leads. Fill us with the wisdom and the strength 
to simply do what is right. Not imagining that we can always know the consequences. We can't. But we can strive to do the right thing and to understand that knowing what's right has to begin with you, Lord. It has to begin with you. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.